Eastern, we're going to wade into um, we're going to wade into the Book of Ezra, and we're going to learn from your word. We're going to learn about what you have for uh, for us. I mean, there's a message here that's on paper, but something that you do is you um, you take what each one of us individually needs. Um, so we've got a message for for not just us as a church, but for us as individuals this morning. And I pray that we would open our own individual hearts for what you have to say uh, to us. And rather than going, well, that's for somebody else, or well, that's for the church in general, we would be able to go, Father God, what do you have to say to me? What do you have to say to um, me as a person, as an individual, as a child of God, as a as, 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 as someone who's been saved by grace, by Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I hope you're wearing your steel-toed boots this morning because I am about to step on your toes. Um, I am about to um, make us uncomfortable because this message makes me uncomfortable. I kept on uh, reading it to myself last night as I was tweaking it, and I kept on making myself uncomfortable. Right? But I kept on looking at it, and God kept on saying, I don't want you to change it. So let's see what he does with it. Okay, if you brought your Bibles, you can get a head start. You can turn to the book of Ezra. I'm giving you a chance to get a head start, because you know Ezra's one of those books that's a little uh, more intriguing to find. So uh, we'll be in the book of Ezra this morning, and we're currently... Um, on a series called, it's behind me, so somebody tell me what it's called. What's the series called? Okay, good. good. When I say it's behind me and it's on the screen, you can respond. That's good. Money Talks. Um, last week we reminded ourselves that our goal is not to get our hard-earned money, but to learn what God's Word teaches about how to manage His money. Amen? Everything we have comes from from God. Whether it's a little or a lot, it all comes from Him. And when we finally stop running from the idea that it's our money and embrace the fact that it isn't ours, but it's His, and He's given it to us to manage, something funny happens. We wind up having more money. And I recently uh, reread the book of Ezra for this message, and as I was reading it, some things jumped out at me that really fit into the arena of money. And let me let me give you some background. Ezra, Ezra is really the, the end of a story. You ever ask God for something on a Monday? Here comes Tuesday and you don't have it yet. Here comes Wednesday and you don't have it yet. Here comes Thursday and you don't have it yet. All of a sudden it's the weekend. God hasn't done what you've asked, and goodness gracious, there is no God. I mean, come on. I prayed for it on Monday. I asked for more prayer at the prayer group on Wednesday. And it's the weekend. And one of the reasons God doesn't always answer on our timeline is because He's God. And He operates on a divine timeline. And you may think it's been a day when it's been a second for him. And the opposite side of that divine scale is sometimes God answers your prayers before you even pray them. You ever notice that? You want to get down and, and pray for somebody's health? And you pray for somebody to get better? When you talk to them later that night, you find out they were healed yesterday? That is amazing. But it's true. God is the God of a divine line and of history. And Ezra reminds us that God is in control of history because Ezra's the end of a story that started 100 years earlier. 100 years before Ezra was around. Uh, the nation of Israel was, well, simply put, they were misbehaving. They were rebelling against a God that had treated them incredibly well. And God judged them. He sent a people called the Babylonians to destroy Jerusalem 
and ransack the temple. The Babylonians hauled off all of Israel's riches, the silver and the gold out of the temple, and took it back with them to Babylon. They also took slaves, people like Shadrach, Meshach, Abed, yeah, that go sound familiar. Then about 70 years later, the Persians come in and they destroy Babylon, which is currently Iraq and Iran, for any of you who are trying to figure out where this is. Um, that king, who was the king of the Persians, was a man named, uh, anybody? Cyrus. Who said Cyrus? Anybody say Cyrus? What's that? No, you're okay. It was the, the Persian king then was King Cyrus. We'll, we'll go over our timelines later after church. King Cyrus made the strangest decision. Nebuchadnezzar's in there, by the way. King Nebuchadnezzar is, is in there, but at this point, uh, King Cyrus makes a very strange decision. He decides to send um, everybody back to Israel to rebuild the temple as the prophets Ezekiel, Daniel, and Jeremiah had prophesied 70 years earlier. So see, Nebuchadnezzar was in there 70 years earlier with Daniel, Brother Lino, so you know your stuff, which is good, because our elder knows his stuff. Okay. So a non-believing pagan king Cyrus, a non-Christian, uh, I guess Christ wasn't around yet, so you could say a non-God or something like that, sends for a man named uh, Zerubbabel. I'm say that five times really fast. And he says, I want you, I guess, Somebody just tried to say it five times really fast up front. And he says to Zerubbabel, I want you to take your people back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Now this is amazing. It's incredible. But there are many others in the area that don't want to see Israel become a superpower again. And the governors of these provinces begin a letter writing campaign. Okay, and they write letters to King Cyrus and basically a whole bunch of legal and politics starts um, letter after letter to the Persian king. Have you lost your mind? Do you realize what could happen if Israel becomes a superpower again? And for years this goes back and forth, gets stuck in the mud. They start the temple, they stop the temple, they start the temple, they stop the temple, and effectively the temple doesn't get rebuilt. Kind of reminds me of a project in Winnipeg that we were promised last year. I was really looking forward to watching a football game last year in Investors Group Field. But last year when I wanted to watch a football game, Kevin, in Investors Group Field, it looked a little bit more like this. Not as far like it, right? It wasn't quite complete yet. Kevin, I know because we're big football fans uh, together. Anyways, four Persian kings later, a guy named Darius becomes king. Four kings later, what King Cyrus had promised to be rebuilt wasn't rebuilt, and Darius comes to power. He gets a letter from these governors. Remember, this is like decades later. Okay? And the letter rating campaign is still going on because every new king, these governors write letters to the king saying, don't rebuild the temple. We don't want Israel to become a superpower. So Darius gets these letters again, but he doesn't, you know, make a decision without doing the homework. So he asks his historians to go study the original decree uh, of King Cyrus to see what happened. And uh, this is this is this is really interesting because he discovers Cyrus's decree, which was, "We will rebuild the temple. You guys can rebuild your temple. I don't have a problem with it." And so Darius writes a letter back to the governors, and here is a paraphrase, my paraphrase, of this letter. Dear governors, remember this is decades later, so people have kind of forgotten. They didn't have like, you know, YouTube and the internet, and so you couldn't Wikipedia what Cyrus had written back then, so you really had to go to your historians and check the scrolls. Dear governors, thank you for your concerns about the rebuilding of the Jerusalem temple. You were correct in assuming that if I knew my history, I would take action regarding the rebuilding of the temple. I would make sure that I did something. 
is what he's saying. I have discovered that my predecessor, King Cyrus, was the king who commissioned the rebuilding of this temple. Therefore, I command that the project go ahead as originally decreed. In addition, not only will you allow the build to take place unhindered, you will assist wherever needed or face significant consequences. Sincerely yours, King Darius. Now, when a king back in those days said you will face significant consequences, he didn't mean you would get a fine. Okay? It's not like one of Pastor Ed's...